So if you have made it up to this far and you've actually watched all three prior videos, give yourself a pat on the back because you have learned a lot today and you have actually achieved quite a lot. So let's move on to the last topic, which is part four of the four uploads that I was promised to, to give you guys today. Let's talk about transient ischemic attacks. Grab a piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're pretty much going to be looking at transient ischemic attacks. This is part four of the videos that we were talking about strokes. And if you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon so you never miss such amazing content every time I post. Grab a piece of paper, grab your pen, and let's go. So remember that previously our transient ischemic attack had a definition of someone who was having symptoms, stroke-like symptoms that were lasting for a duration less than 24 hours. Typically the episodes used to last less than an hour. But in 2009, the American Heart Association and American Stroke Association actually revised this definition. So currently the definition of a transient ischemic attack is just simply a transient episode where you get this neurologic dysfunction that's caused by focal brain, spinal cord or retinal ischemia without any acute tissue infarction. That's the definition of a transient ischemic attack. Remember that the annual risk of future ischemic stroke after a TIA actually increases. So on the initial ischemic stroke, it's about three to 4% with an incidence as high as 11% in the next seven days. And then after five years, it's about 24 to 29%. The clinical symptoms of a TIA typically are going to be lasting less than an hour and often they may actually even last less than 30 minutes, but sometimes a prolonged episode can sometimes occur. Clinical features, remember that the TIA is going to be lasting only a few minutes and the symptoms will often resolve before the patient actually even presents to the clinician. So this is the patients that actually have what we call a mini stroke and those patients that we say that they had a stroke, but they recovered. So... Questions should actually be addressed to the patient, the family members, those that witnessed it, and even the emergency medical services regarding the following things. The behavior of the patient, if the speech of the patient was affected, the gait of the patient was affected, the memory of the patient, and even the movement of the patient. Initial vital signs should be recorded, including temperature, blood pressure, heart rate, rhythm, as well as a respiratory rate, the pattern and the oxygen saturation, and the examiner must strive to actually assess the overall health of the patient and the appearance of the patient. You must make account of the attentiveness of the patient, the ability of them to interact with the examiner, the language and memory skills, and even overall hydration and development of the patient. Remember, the goal of the physical examination is to uncover any neurological deficit that may not be there and it's also to evaluate any underlying cardiovascular system so make sure that you do your cranial nerve testing make sure that you determine any somatic motor strength so you should do your power testing you make sure that you do your somatic sensory testing your speech and language testing you should also test for the cerebellar system so be sure to actually watch the patient walk the diagnosis is often made by certain investigations. We want to rule out other conditions such as metabolic drug-induced etiologies which can present in a similar fashion to a TIA. So generally, we want to get some neuroimaging which should be done at least within 24 hours of the onset of symptoms. A magnetic resonance imaging and an MRI is with a diffused weighted image actually is preferred. But in our case, we don't have the MRIs ready and available, so you can do a non-contrast CT scan. Other investigations include carotid Doppler ultrasound of the neck, carotid angiography, as well as the magnetic resonance angiography. Blood investigations are similar to those that we ordered in a patient that was having a stroke. So a serum glucose to rule out hypoglycemia, full blood count with a differential, serum electrolytes, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, cardiac enzymes, lipid profile, as well as coagulation studies. Do not forget to do a 12-lead ECG um, strip. Then, of course, some additional tests will be there dependent on the history. For example, a syphilis serology, if they are suspecting that syphilis may be involved, antiphospholipid antibodies, toxicology screens, hemoglobin electrophoresis, serum protein electrophoresis, and in some cases, a CSF examination. Management, usually for patients with uh, recent, which is one week or less, TIA, 
Usually the guidelines recommend a timely hospital referral with hospitalization, especially if the patient has the following things. If they have a crescendo TIA, where the symptoms are actually increasing in severity, they have a duration of symptom that is longer than one hour, or if they're symptomatic for internal carotid stenosis, that's greater than 50%. If they have a known cardiac source of emboli, for example, in atrial fibrillation, if they have a known hypercoagulable state, or if the appropriate combination of the California score of ABCD score as a category four, then we want to refer them to the hospital for in-hospital management. So because there is actually a short-term risk of stroke after TIA, we have to aggressively manage these patients that actually come in with TIAs. So antithrombotic therapy actually should be initiated as soon as possible and as soon as you rule out any hemorrhage that is there. So if it's a patient that has non-cardiogenic TIA, you want to cover them with aspirin, 50 to 325 milligrams per day. Sometimes you can use aspirin plus extended release dipyridamol, or in some cases, if they're allergic to aspirin, we can use clopidogrel. If it's a patient that has a stroke and while using stroke prevention medication, typically this is recommended for uh, cardioembolic uh, TIA, and we're going to be dividing them into main groups. We have those patients that actually have atrial fibrillation after a TIA, so these ones are going to be needing long-term anticoagulation with warfarin. So our target INR is between two to three. We, those that are on aspirin 325 milligrams or those that are unable to take anticoagulant can actually uh, be um, anti be taken warfarin and the remember warfarin and aspirin are not supposed to be given concurrently then in the normal in the normal scenario then in those that are having acute myocardial infarction with left ventricular thrombosis then oral anticoagulants uh, with uh, warfarin and our target INR is between two to three then concurrent aspirin up to 165 milligrams per day for those that are actually having ischemic artery disease coronary artery disease this is a lecture that we'll talk about on its own and management using these anticoagulants in those that have dilated cardiomyopathy we want to give the oral anticoagulation with warfarin and our target INR is two to three, or we can give them antiplatelet therapy. In those that have rheumatic uh, my mitral valve disease, oral anticoagulation with warfarin with our target INR being two to three. Then for the patients that actually have TIA, that's due to stenosis. That's about 50 to 99% of a major intracranial artery. The following things can be done for them. So we rather give them aspirin 50 to 325 milligrams per day rather than our warfarin. And then of course, our maintenance blood pressure is to keep them at 140 to 140 over 90. And our total cholesterol uh, is going to be below 200 milligrams per deciliter. Angioplasty or stenting is sometimes done and it's investigational and the and, and the utility and the the efficacy of these procedures in TIAs has yet to be established because more clinical data is actually needed. Thank you for spending your time to listen to this lecture on transient ischemic attack. If you enjoyed all the lectures on stroke and the stroke syndromes, please drop a like, drop a comment because it helps with the algorithm. To Zambia and beyond, thank you for spending your time to watch these four videos. Until next time, my name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.